Boldwood presents The Land Girls of Goodwill House Written by Fenella J. Miller And read by Julia Franklin The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Goodwill House, August 1940 Joanna Lady Harcourt was touched by the response from the village to the near disaster of the fire in the Victorian wing of Goodwill House. The morning afterwards, not only did one tender from the base turn up, but also an engine from Ramsgate. There was an absolute army of willing volunteers from the village. She'd found a pair of slacks, not something she often wore, as she thought it rather fussed for a woman to be wearing trousers, and had been outside to greet and thank everybody. There were heavy canvas hosepipes trailing across the once shiny parquet floors in the Grand Hall, as the engine from Ramsgate did its best to pump out the gallons of water that had been pumped in last night. Joanna's adopted children, Joe and Liza, were up and dressed in their oldest clothes, ready to muck in as they always did. Jean, almost a member of the family, had every available kettle and saucepan boiling, ready to make tea and toast for all the helpers. I'm not surprised the three of you are wearing your gumboots, Joanna said. I fear the parquet flooring will never recover from the soaking it got last night. Jean replied, as she made the first pot of tea, Better a wet floor than a house going up in flames. Liza's going to take over here whilst I help your mother-in-law. She was fast asleep when I came down. Too much excitement isn't good for someone her age. Jean had come to Goodwill House to be a personal maid for Joanna's mother-in-law, Elizabeth. But over the months, had become first a seamstress and now housekeeper. She was an excellent cook, efficient and a good friend. But she'd never really replaced Betty, who had died so recently of measles. Joanna blinked back tears as she thought of her friend, and how shocked she'd be to know that her own husband had possibly set fire to the house in an act of revenge. Bert had been dismissed and lost his home because of her intervention. Lassie, the enormous dog Joanna had found and rescued from the Victorian wing a few months ago, nudged her leg, almost sending her from her feet. Stop that, silly boy. I know you haven't had your breakfast, but then neither has anybody else. Joe came in from the yard where he'd been taking care of the chickens, ducks and geese, as well as checking that Star, the only horse they still had on the premises, had sufficient water for the day. I'll feed him now, Ma, and then I'll go next door and see what I can do to help. There's a sergeant from the base wants to speak to you. Her pus skipped a beat. I'm coming. I think it must be the young man who was in charge last night. He's called Sergeant Sergeant. <laughs> Isn't that amusing? He didn't tell me who he was, but he's definitely the bloke in charge. I'm surprised Manston has let him come a second time. What if a plane crashes whilst he's here? I'm sure they thought of that, Joe. I expect if a squadron scrambled, then they'll return immediately. It's only two miles to the base, and they could be back in ten minutes. Why was she standing here talking, when she could be outside meeting the handsome young firefighter who had made her feel like a girl again? She smiled wryly as she headed into the yard. Joanna had never had the opportunity to enjoy just being young, to fall in and out of love with a series of handsome young men. There hadn't been the opportunity, as her late husband, David, had snatched her up as soon as she'd left school. Sergeant John Sargent was giving orders to a couple of his men when she emerged into the early morning sunlight. This gave her the opportunity to look at him in daylight. Last night, She'd only noticed his odd eyes, one green and one brown, and his flashing smile. Now she could see that he was a head taller than her, had an athletic build, 
and thick, wavy black hair. But, as he had his back to her, she still couldn't see his face. He finished his conversation and turned. Instead of striding across to her, as she'd expected, he remained stationary for a moment, staring at her, as if he too wanted to get a better look at the person who'd made an impression on him last night. She could see now that his complexion was darker than hers. Perhaps he had Mediterranean ancestors. Then he smiled and came to join her. Good morning, my lady. It won't take the blokes from Ramsgate long to remove the surface water from your home, but it's going to take weeks for it to dry out completely. You'll need to leave the windows open. Better to let it dry naturally. It was fortunate he'd carried on talking, as for a few moments she was unable to gather her thoughts. He was even better looking, more attractive, more interesting than she thought last night. And he was having a very strange effect on her breathing. On everything, really. Thank you, Sergeant, Sergeant. We do appreciate you coming back, as there was no necessity for you to do so. Did you ask the local fireman to return? I did. Our tenders aren't equipped to remove water, only to pump it and foam onto a fire. Of course, you don't deal with house fires. Joanna said. Why did you come last night, then? I was on duty, my lady, and saw the flames. None of our kites were up, so it made sense to come and help. I'm glad that you did. Thank you. If you hadn't been here to help the Ramsgate crew, it would have been even worse. She found herself mesmerised by his eyes, and the way they seemed to reflect the sunlight somehow. She forced her mind back to a more sensible topic. My son's worried that there'll not be enough tenders to take care of any incoming aircraft whilst you're here. He grinned. We've three others. We'll not be missed for an hour or two. I'm afraid the news from next door isn't good. I thought the upper floors relatively unscathed by the fire, but on closer inspection I think the entire structure could now be unsound. Are you suggesting it should be demolished? I am. There's plenty of salvageable materials that can be used by builders repairing bomb damage. He took her arm and moved her aside as two firemen emerged from the door, rolling up one of the hose pipes as they did so. Look where you're going, you cretins! There are civilians on the premises! This sounded harsh, but was said with a smile, and the two men took it in good part. They nodded at her and apologised were almost sending her flying. I'm in the way out here, Sergeant. I just came out to thank you, and to say that there'll be tea and toast arriving shortly. He chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> we were talking about knocking down a third of your stately home, and you offer me toast and tea. I've always hated the Victorian wing. It's not been used this century. I'll be glad to see it gone, and the house will look much better for it. Don't take my word for it. After all, I'm more familiar with aircraft than houses. Someone from Ramsgate Fire Station will be in touch in due course. Joanna couldn't think of a way to prolong the conversation, of any legitimate reason why she could invite him back. But she really wanted to get to know him better. Liza emerged, carrying a tray with a dozen mugs of steaming tea, and Jean was close behind holding a second tray, with plates piled high with toast. From the smell, it was dripping and salt, not butter and marmalade. Not her favourite combination, but no doubt these hard-working men would appreciate it. Joanna retreated to the safety of the kitchen, deliberately removing temptation. What was wrong with her? Was it possible she'd become infatuated with this young man? After just two meetings? This was the sort of behaviour one would expect from a girl of Liza's age, not a mature, sensible woman of thirty-six. She hid in the safety of her small sitting room until the men from Manston and those from Ramsgate had departed. Elizabeth came in search of her. 
There you are, my dear. Why are you hiding in here? I needed time to come to terms with what happened last night. The house is in chaos. Everywhere smells of smoke. And I expect the furniture and carpets are beyond hope. Are you worrying about the cost of replacing them? Her mother-in-law said. Surely David would have had some sort of insurance against fire damage. I've no idea, as he didn't share that sort of information with me. The young man from the base said that in his opinion the entire wing should be demolished. But I'm waiting until this is confirmed by a senior person from Ramsgate before I do anything. Instead of sitting here moping, Joanna, why don't you look through the pile of documents that Mr. Broom sent over a few weeks ago? I hadn't thought of that. Thank you for reminding me. To be honest, I just put them on a shelf and forgot about them. Elizabeth frowned and looked around the room as if she didn't know why she'd come in. I came here to ask you something, but I can't remember what it was. This was happening more frequently, but as long as this mental decline manifested itself as forgetfulness, Joanna wasn't particularly bothered. Hardly surprising that Elizabeth was a bit confused after the drama of last night. You came to find me, Elizabeth, and I'm glad that you did. I'm hoping there's a cup of coffee available in the kitchen. Shall we go and see? Her mother-in-law beamed. That is why I was looking for you. Jean has just made the coffee, and Liza has made some sort of cake to go with it. The old woman grimaced. I know there's the war on. That butter and sugar are rationed for good reason. But cake just doesn't taste the same nowadays. Joanna agreed, and taking Elizabeth's arm, she escorted her out through the damp hall and out onto the terrace, where they'd taken refuge from the flames last night. It had been agreed earlier that as long as the weather held, they would spend as much time out here as possible. The twins and Jean were there already, as was the dog. The table had been repositioned, so they had their back to the house, and couldn't see the fire-damaged Victorian wing. We were about to send out a search party, Ma, Joe said, as he hurried across to his adopted grandmother to lead her to her seat. I'm sorry, I must have dozed off. I didn't get much sleep last night. Elizabeth cackled, and no one did Joanna, so going to sleep was no excuse. Once they were settled, Joe lifted the heavy silver coffee jug and filled three cups. There was a second jug containing cocoa made with milk for the twins, who didn't like coffee. The cake, despite its provenance, was in fact delicious, and even Elizabeth approved. They chatted about the weather, enjoying the unexpected quiet of a day, so far not destroyed by the noise of aircraft taking off from the base. I'm surprised we haven't had a visit from the police, aren't you? Jean said. Didn't that sergeant from Manston think the fire was set deliberately? I do hope that isn't the case, Joanna said. But it doesn't mean there's a lunatic trying to dispose of us all. Elizabeth was upset by this suggestion, but the twins just looked interested and waited for her response. I'm not sure he was trying to commit murder. Setting fire to the Victorian wing was going to cause us inconvenience and expense, but was unlikely to do any more than that. It's irrelevant what his motives were, isn't it? Arson is a very serious offence, Jean said. It is, of course, but it could have been accidental. John Sargent preferred to drive the tender, although he could have delegated this task to one of the others. Driving meant that none of his blokes expected him to chat, and this suited him just fine. He preferred his own company, avoided the sergeant's mess, and what free time he got, which was precious little, was spent reading or playing the harmonica. His dad had taught him how to play when he was a nipper, and he'd become an expert over the years. On the return journey to the base, he'd plenty to think about. 
The only reason he'd taken the tender to Goodwill House this morning was to see if his reaction to the owner of the property, Lady Joanna Harcourt, had been imagined or genuine. He tuned out the jovial conversation of his men and thought about this second meeting with a woman so far above him socially that to even contemplate a relationship with her was like suggesting he invited Princess Elizabeth to afternoon tea. Oi, Sarge, what do you think? Percy, a corporal, and therefore his right-hand man, shouted above the noise of the crossly tender, which rattled and banged, making normal conversation almost impossible. I'll think about it, he yelled back, thinking this would cover most eventualities. It seemed to satisfy his men, who continued talking amongst themselves and left him to his thoughts. No doubt he'd discover what he was supposed to be considering at some point during the day. Joanna. He refused to think of her in any other way, as he didn't hold with titles. He wasn't a communist, but was certainly a socialist. He believed that nobody had the inalienable right to be in charge of the country just because they'd been born with a silver spoon in their mouth. His aversion to the upper classes was why he'd refused to become an officer, as most of those were a group of chinless wonders, in his opinion. He could have trained to be a flyer, but again he'd refused, as he didn't want to kill anyone himself. He'd been tempted to declare himself a conscientious objector but had decided that Hitler and his Nazis had to be stopped, and sitting around on the sidelines didn't seem right. Therefore, he'd volunteered to be an RAF firefighter. They were now actually training men to take on this vital role, but he'd had to learn on the job. Once he'd understood whether to use foam or water on a fire, could get into one of the asbestos suits, and be ready to walk into a fire, and try and pull out the poor bugger trapped in his cockpit, he was considered proficient. Three minutes was all they got to rescue the pilot or the crew when a plane crashed. He wasn't surprised that fire was the biggest fear of any flyer. He'd seen with his own eyes what a horrific way to die it was. He parked the tender in its designated place. His men knew to check all the equipment was in working order, and all tanks were filled before they retreated to the area at the back of the hangar where they could get a cupper and a wad. He took care of the paperwork, not that there was any, as the visit hadn't involved them doing any actual work, and, being efficient, he'd already filled in the reports for last night's event. The fire crews, like the flyers, were on duty night and day. However, unlike the Brill Cream boys, his blokes had a regular twelve-hour shift. They either worked from midday to midnight, or midnight to midday. His crew, and the others that had accompanied him last night, were on the latter shift. He had a thermos in his cubbyhole, so he didn't need to join the others. Someone had put a greaseproof paper-wrapped spam sandwich on his desk, and he smiled. He might bark at his men, it was tough on them, but he was a good leader, and under his watch no one had died so far. He looked after them. They did the same for him. As John sipped his tepid stewed tea, he wondered how Joanna would react if she was aware of his interest in her. He grinned. She'd be horrified, disgusted that someone of his class had the temerity to even consider her as a possible partner. The phone jangled noisily, and he picked it up. He dropped it back on the cradle and was on his feet in an instant, all thoughts of romance forgotten. His crew were already looking in his direction. They would have heard the telephone themselves. Crippled Wellington on its way, wireless on the blink, so no idea if anybody bailed out or is injured. Percy, you and me into the suits. A Vickers Wellington was a medium bomber with a crew of six. A pilot, wireless operator, a forward and rear gunner, a bomb aimer and the navigator. It was highly unlikely that all six of them would escape unscathed. In fact, if any of them got out alive, it'd be a good day. The two ambulances were ready. They held the driver and a medic, and he was sure they'd both be needed this morning. 
He hoped the three tenders would be sufficient. It was unpleasant and suffocatingly hot inside the asbestos suit, but it meant that he and Percy could go into a burning wreck if necessary. The unmistakable sound of the damaged bomber approaching meant they should start moving. The fire crews and ambulances weren't the only ones heading for the main runway. The ground crews were appearing from the hangars, temporarily abandoning their crucial work keeping the Blenheims, Hurricanes and Spitfires airborne. The kite was flying low, smoke pouring from the left engine, but the right prop was still functioning. John's breath hissed through his teeth. It mightn't be as bad as he'd feared as the landing gear was down. This wasn't going to be a belly flop, possibly not even a crash landing. The fire trucks and ambulances raced alongside the runway so they could be in action the moment it touched down. There were bullet holes in the fuselage, and John couldn't see the rear gunner, but that didn't mean he was dead or injured. He could just have made his way to the front of the kite to be ready to bail out if necessary. Obviously, he wasn't driving, as that would be impossible in his unwieldy fireproof suit. The bomber was travelling fast, and it hit the deck hard, the landing gear buckling, and pitching the kite onto its nose. There was a horrendous screeching of metal tearing, and he watched a gust as the Wellington broke apart on impact. The front half continued to slide forwards, flames now licking the fuselage beneath the cockpit. The rear half slewed sideways, ploughing up the grass that ran beside the runway. He was off the tender and racing to the front section where the crew were most likely to be. Percy was close behind him. His men didn't need telling to get the foam directed at the flames. Water would make the conflagration worse in this case. Two of his men had a metal ladder up against the open end, and John scrambled up it. Doing anything in the asbestos suit was more difficult, but he'd become used to the cumbersome clothing. Without it, he wouldn't be able to go into the heart of the fire and rescue any of the poor sods that were still alive. Three figures staggered towards him through the smoke, stumbling over the various pipes and pieces of equipment, desperate to get out. This way, quickly now, down the ladder. There's someone there to take care of you. He didn't wait to see if they got out. He was pretty sure somebody would be there to assist them. There were still three others unaccounted for somewhere ahead. His voice was muffled, and he needed to save his breath, as it was becoming difficult to breathe. Smoke was as likely to kill you as the flames in this sort of fire. John grabbed Percy's arm and pointed. There was no need to say anything else. The front gunner had gone for a burden. Too late to do anything for him. However, both the navigator and pilot were still alive, and so far no more than a little singed. I'll take the pilot. You get the other bloke. Don't dawdle. We've got no more than a minute before the whole lot blows up. He reached down and slung the pilot over his shoulder, paused for a moment to make sure that Percy had done the same with the other injured man, and then they picked their way carefully through the debris, heading for the safety of the runway. Eager hands removed his comatose patient from his shoulder, and then he slid down the ladder. The same was done for Percy, and he too arrived safely on the ground. John pulled off his helmet. Get back, everybody! Get back! There's still fuel in the tanks and it's going to explode at any moment. No one needed telling twice, and he was hauled headfirst onto the rear of the nearest tender and then had to cling on for dear life as it raced away. Not a moment too soon. Chapter Two Sally O'Reilly, who only answered to Sal, had changed into her smart land girl uniform in the ladies' room on the station at Romford. If then, the bloke she was trying to get away from, had seen these clothes, he'd have stopped her leaving and sold the lot on the market. She reckoned not even her own ma would recognise her now. Being of medium height and build, everything fitted just lovely. She stuffed the things she'd been wearing into an old sack, intending to dump it at the earliest possible opportunity. Her battered cardboard suitcase now held the dungarees, 
beige short-sleeved shirts and a spare pair of socks, a Macintosh and overall coat, as well as some smashing brown leather shoes. She was supposed to bring two spare sets of underwear, a nightdress and house slippers, as these weren't supplied. Imagine having two sets of spare knickers and bras. One on and one off was how it went in her family. Lil, her best friend, had joined the WAF, and she'd got everything given to her. Sal had been tempted to sign up herself, but didn't fancy being bossed about all day by snooty officers. She knew nothing about the countryside, wasn't keen on animals, but as a land girl, she'd just be working like she had sewing frocks in the sweatshop and could leave if she wanted. She viewed the gumboots with dislike. She couldn't shove them into the suitcase, so she'd have to wear them, despite the fact that it was blooming hot today. When she'd collected her uniform, the lady had said she'd be issued with winter wear in the autumn. The breeches were a bit baggy, but the shirt and green pullover fitted all right. She wasn't too keen on the hat, but at least it hid her very distinctive hair. She patted her curls. She didn't have to use peroxide to make it this colour. She was a natural blonde. The train to London steamed in, and Sal marched out, head held high, proud to be in uniform, but even happier to be getting away from Poplar, her rotten family, and her even worse boyfriend. He thought she was visiting her nan who lived in Romford. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been able to sneak away. By the time she arrived at this Newton Abbott place, she was knackered. It had taken all day to get to Devon. She'd had nothing to eat, only one cup of tea to drink, and her feet were squelching in her boots. She'd managed to dump her civilian clothes and only had her overfilled suitcase and her Mac to carry. She emerged into the sunlight and immediately spotted two other girls dressed the same as her. One was a brunette, she looked like a model in one of those posh magazines. Her uniform might be the same colour, but it certainly wasn't the same as Sal's. The other girl was a bit older, probably in her twenties, with red hair and a lovely smile. She looked just the ticket. Come and join us. We're hoping to find a taxi, as it's more than three miles from here to Seal Hain Agricultural College. The speaker was the brunette, and she was ever so posh. That seemed nice enough. Cool, so I ever so. I need the bulk first and I'm gasping for a cuppa. Sal smiled at both of them and they laughed. Dump your things, we'll take care of them. There wasn't a ladies' room on the platform, but you could nip behind those bushes. I don't think anybody will notice. This suggestion from the red-haired girl was quite unexpected, but suited her down to the ground. I'm Sal. I expect you've guessed I'm from these stains. I'm Daphne and I come from Colchester, the red-haired girl said. I'm Charlotte, but you can call me Lottie or Charlie. I answer to both. I'm from Guildford. Fair enough. I won't be a tick. Sal was glad she'd been wearing her gumboots, as these were easier to wipe clean on the grass. She'd been that desperate. Her aim hadn't been good. She dashed back to find the two of them smoking. Not woodbines, but something posh, like senior service. This was one vice she didn't have. She liked a bit of how's your father and enjoyed a tipple or two, but had never taken to bags. Right, I'm going to take these bleeding boots off. My poor feet are swimming in there, and I reckon I can wring out my socks. She looked at their luggage. They both got two suitcases, so didn't have the same problem. If you put your spare socks on, you can tie your boots together and wear them round your neck, like a very smelly rubber necklace, Charlie suggested, as she blew a perfect smoke ring. Sal had been about to apologise for using bad language, but neither of them seemed bothered by her swearing. She'd fallen on her feet, and she reckoned that these two were going to make good mates. She hooked her boots off, the socks followed, and it was lovely to have fresh air on her bare toes. If I open that bugger, I'll never get it closed again. We'll manage. Come on, get a move on. We've got a long walk ahead of us. 
Daphne said cheerfully. The stout brown leather brogues were ever so comfortable and looked a treat with her brown corduroy breeches. Oh, I'm parched, and me stomach thinks me throat's been cut. I got a couple of bob, and if we can find a calf, I'll treat you to a bum and something to drink. That's the ticket. There's bound to be somewhere we can get a cup of tea, at least, Daphne said, as she picked up a suitcase in each hand. They looked heavy, but she carried them as if they weighed nothing at all. With her smelly boots slung over her shoulder, she'd almost gagged when she'd hung them round her neck. Sal picked up her case and followed Charlie, who'd gone first. They found the perfect place, as far as she was concerned, but Charlie wasn't impressed. Daphne was happy with it, so they went in. A jolly old geezer, with a pair of false teeth that moved up and down when he spoke, greeted them. Welcome, girls. My lady wife has just made a fine batch of scones. I'm afraid we can't offer butter or cream, but there's plenty of marge and jam. Thank you. That sounds perfect. A pot of tea and scones for three. Thank you, Charlie said with her posh accent. Put your luggage in the corner, girls. It'll be out of the way. They did as he asked, and took the only vacant table. They got one or two funny looks from those already there, but mostly it was nods and smiles. The place was busy, and they'd been lucky to get a table. You got plenty of time to eat your tea before the bus goes, he said, as he vanished through the bead curtain to give their order to his wife. A boss? That's a hoot! We'd have looked very silly if it had sailed past us as we were trudging along the road with our suitcases, Charlie said. He didn't say when it was going, but I reckon some of them at the other tables will be catching it too. Daphne swiveled in her chair and spoke to the nearest customer. Excuse me, could you please tell me what time the bus that passes the agricultural college leaves here? Four o'clock, then there's not another one until six. You can't miss it as it pulls up right outside this cafe, and most of us in here will be getting on it. Thank you, that's very helpful. Daphne turned back and smiled at both of them. Do you know what time we're supposed to report? No, my letter just said I had to be here today. What about you, Sal? I didn't take no notice of all that writing and such. I'm not too clever with reading and writing. Then, being a land girl is the Perfect place for you, Charlie said, not at all shocked by Sal's revelation. I'm not so sure about that. I've never seen a cow. I ain't keen on fresh air, and I don't like the cold. The other two laughed, and Sal joined in, enjoying being a part of the group. She'd never had many friends, and hoped these two might one day become hers. Joanna put out all the ledgers, folders and files that had arrived in an official-looking cardboard box from the solicitor's office a few weeks ago. So much had been going on in the house that she'd not got round to looking in them. Even the household accounts had been handled by David, so she'd absolutely no experience dealing with the things she was looking at. However, it shouldn't be beyond her capabilities to find evidence that there was some sort of valid fire insurance on the house. She'd only looked through a fraction of the things on her desk when Elizabeth joined her. I thought you might like some help, my dear. I might be decrepit and rather forgetful nowadays, but my eyesight's still excellent, and I can read as well as I ever could. I didn't want to ask you. It's a very tedious task, but having you sharing it with me will make it less onerous. Joanna pointed to the pathetically small pile of files that she'd examined. Those are done. I'm afraid that all the rest of the stuff on the desk has still to be looked at. Elizabeth nodded and began to flick through the items, and for a moment Joanna thought she wasn't actually reading anything. Right, my dear, you're making this far more difficult than it needs to be. These files are carefully organised and labelled with the contents. There's no need to look in half of them. If her mother-in-law had announced she was a devil worshipper, Joanna couldn't have been more surprised. Good heavens! How stupid of me! I just started at one end and didn't actually read what was written on the front. 
Thank goodness you came in and pointed it out to me. Then let's put what we don't need back in the boxes. The task will seem less daunting, my dear, once we've done that. They work well together, and in less than an hour, Elizabeth had found the paperwork that proved the buildings were insured against fire. There you are. You have your answer. Perhaps it might be best to ask your solicitor to deal with this. I certainly won't, Joanna said. I'm Lady Harcourt. I think that carries enough weight to get a favourable response, don't you? Let's hope so, my dear. I thought I heard several cars coming down the drive. Are you expecting anyone? Yes, actually I am. The police from Ramsgate have to investigate the arson. And also, someone from the fire department must confirm that the young sergeant is correct about having to demolish the Victorian wing. I think the insurance company would prefer you to do that, as it would be cheaper for them than rebuilding it. This remark puzzled Joanna. Surely it doesn't matter which I choose to do. If the building's insured, then I should be paid the value of that wing. Things might have changed over the years, my dear. But when I was living here, the newly installed indoor plumbing proved unsatisfactory, and the ceiling above the drawing room fell in. My husband, not a particularly pleasant man, nor someone who shared anything unless forced, on this occasion was so incensed by the insurance company's decision that I would have had to been both deaf and a simpleton not to have known what happened. What did happen? He was forced to accept a lesser settlement, just repairs to the ceiling and replastering, when he'd wanted the entire ceiling removed and replaced, as what remained was definitely damaged by the water. Let's hope the company I have to deal with isn't the same one. Jean appeared at the door. Excuse me, my ladies, but the same two policemen, the unpleasant ones who came before, are here. Also, there are two police cars with several uniformed men heading for the Victorian wing. Would you be kind enough to direct the detectives here? The study seems an appropriate place to speak to such people. To her surprise, Elizabeth wandered off, saying she needed to fetch something from the garden. Fortunately, Jean had overheard this vague remark. Don't worry, I'll go with her. Thank you, that's kind of you. Joanna said. I really don't understand what's going on with her. The past two hours she's been sharp, absolutely wonderful sorting out these papers. And now she's drifted off into a world of her own. I'll go after her and send the inspector and his sergeant to you. Shall I ask Liza to make tea or coffee? No, I want this meeting to be as brief as possible. I don't suppose this chief inspector will be any more accommodating than he was the last time. An hour later, the sergeant had written down, laboriously, a report of what had happened. Bert Smith was being searched for, but hadn't been found so far. I can assure you, my lady, that we take arson very seriously. He'll go away for years. Are you not being rather premature, Chief Inspector? Joanna said. It could have been a vagrant. It might not have been Bert at all. Am I not correct in thinking that there has to be conclusive evidence in order to charge a person? The obnoxious man stared at her with dislike. My lady, I can assure you that my man is searching at this very moment for the necessary evidence. He smirked and nodded at her, as if she was too stupid to understand the legal processes involved. Smith will be apprehended and charged. Circumstantial evidence is more than enough in this case. That man made threats to you and has now carried them out. She decided to end the conversation. Thank you for your time. Please keep me informed about anything you discover from your investigation. Good morning, gentlemen, and thank you for coming. They had no option but to depart, but did so with bad grace. Joanna watched them drive away faster than was safe and was relieved when their car vanished onto the road at the end of the drive. The two police cars remained, but there was no sign of the men who'd arrived in them. 
The telephone jangled while she was watching through the grand hall window. Goodwill House? Lady Harcourt speaking. Good morning, my lady. Mrs. Doherty here. I just wanted to let you know that there's been a slight delay in sending your contingent of land girls. The young ladies we had earmarked for your billet have now gone elsewhere. I see. Does that mean I won't be getting anyone? Or is there just a delay? My word, of course you'll be getting girls. They're now training at an agricultural college in Devon. They'll be with you by the end of the month, only a week or two after the others would have come. I'm sorry for any inconvenience. Actually, Mrs. Doggerty, we've had a few problems this end, so the delay will suit us perfectly. We had a fire in the disused wing, and although nothing was damaged on this side, it will take a week or so to get the house dried out and ready. Excellent. You'll be given twenty-four hours' notice of their arrival. The girls will be expected to make their own way to Goodwill House. One of the reasons it's ideal to have girls living with you is that it's on a bus route and central to the farms and market gardens that we wish them to work on. After a few further pleasantries, the call ended. Joanna could smell coffee being brewed in the kitchen and headed that way. Elizabeth was sitting at the table talking to the twins and seemed quite unaware that less than half an hour ago she'd been distracted and not herself at all. Having land girls wouldn't be any different from having WAF, and both Joanna and Elizabeth so enjoyed the laughter and bustle of a full house. That night, as she was brushing her hair prior to retiring, Joanna examined her reflection more critically than usual. Her hair was lustrous, not a single strand of grey. Eyes bright, her lashes long, and her teeth white and even. She stood up and flattened her nightgown against her naked form. Her breasts were still pert, her waist small, and her hips satisfactorily rounded. She smiled at her daring. Was she really contemplating having a liaison with a handsome sergeant? Why else would she be so interested in her appearance, especially her figure? John considered his day a success. Five of the six crew had been saved, three completely unscathed, and the other two had minor burns and concussion, but not so serious that they'd be out of action for long. After any incident like this, he felt obliged to join his men in the mess for a jar or two before they headed for their billets. The runway was already cleared, the holes filled in, and the only sign that there had been a crash was the blackened patches on the concrete. His men hadn't been required again before they finished their shift. He now had to clean up, snatch a few hours' kip, get some scoff, and then be back on duty at midnight. When he arrived at the hangar that night, he was told the four squadrons had been scrambled twice that afternoon. He'd learned to sleep through any noise and hadn't heard them go or return. Two poor bastards in a Blenheim had been shot down in flames over the channel, but all the other kites had returned safely. Let's hope for a quiet night, lads. More than enough excitement yesterday, he said, as he filled his thermos flask. Billy said some posh bird rang and left a message for you. Going up in the world, are you, Sarge? This will be Lady Harcourt about the fire we went to the other night. I can't ring an house, I'll do it in the morning. He glared at the speaker. An irk, the lowest rank, and a nasty bit of work. It's none of your bloody business. You shouldn't be poking about in my office. If you do it again, you'll be on jankers. The man muttered something obscene under his breath, but John decided to ignore it. If he put all the blokes who swore at him or about him on a charge, there'd be nobody left to fight fires. Everybody swore, and apart from this one individual, it didn't mean anything. He prided himself on having a happy team, but was tempted to put Travis on a charge just to get rid of him. The note was left prominently on the desk, but could only have been read by Travis if he'd actually been in the office, which was out of bounds to all but NCOs. 
Joanna hadn't left a number. It didn't do to bandy that around, and hadn't even left a name. She must have guessed that he'd know who it was. He screwed the paper up and tossed it into the cardboard box put aside for paper waste. This was recycled somewhere. Nothing went to waste nowadays, and paper was in short supply, like everything else. As soon as it was light enough, he got the men to clean the tenders. The engines would have been checked when the tenders weren't in use. He'd ample opportunity to think about the phone call he had to make. In fact, he'd done nothing but think about Joanna since he'd met her. He wasn't stupid. He knew that nothing permanent could come of it. But there was something about her that made him put these doubts aside. He was probably delusional to even think she might consider having an affair with him. It could be nothing more than that, and for him, it wouldn't be enough. That said, if that's all that was on offer, he'd take it happily. He smiled wryly at his crazy thoughts. She'd hardly telephone the base for personal reasons. It could only be something to do with the fire. However, a bloke could dream, couldn't he? Chapter Three Sal stared out of the bus window, eyes wide and mouth open, as the place where she was to spend the next four weeks became visible over the hedge. Blimey! Would you look at that? It's like a blooming palace! That's what it is! I've never seen nothing like it! She was sitting next to the window, and her two new friends were sitting together in front of her. Her battered suitcase, barely holding together, was on the seat next to her not in the luggage space at the front. Sensibly, she'd left her gum boots with the suitcases as she didn't want them next to her. It looks impressive, Charlie said as she turned round to speak to her. I can't imagine why the benefactor who founded this place wanted to build an agricultural college looking like this. It should be more functional, in my opinion. Will we be living in that building? The bus rocked to a halt, and the conductor shouted down to them that they had to get out here. Sal clutched her suitcase in both arms, terrified it had fall to bits before she got off. Here you are. I don't suppose you'll even notice the smell after a few days, Daphne said, as she hung the boots over Sal's shoulder before picking up her own suitcases. It was quite a hike from the bus stop to the building, and as they approached, she saw there were other girls dressed the same as them, all of them smart as paint and looking just as new. None of them have their luggage, Charlie said. I think that's the main entrance over there. Shall we announce ourselves and find out where we're billeted? Neither Sal nor Daphne argued, as Charlie seemed a natural leader. There was something to do with her posh voice, Sal reckoned. They were directed to the far side of the huge building and told that their dormitory was on the first floor. They'd be sharing it with nine others. It appears that all twelve of us will be going to the same place when we finish our training. So, the powers that be want us to get to know each other, Charlie told them. Makes sense, Sal replied. If the others are as nice as you two, then I'll be happy as Larry. Fortunately, she made it to the room without spilling her belongings on the stairs. There were three vacant beds at the far end of the room, which were obviously for them. Everybody else had unpacked, so they did the same. Do we have to wear these thick pullovers? It's blooming hot today. I'm not wearing this horrible hat whilst I'm here. I'll put it on when I'm out. But that's it. I agree, said Charlie. None of the girls out there were wearing them so I assume it's all right to abandon the hats. I'm going in search of the W.C. and bathrooms. You coming with me, Daphne? I am. I suppose we'll have to get used to nipping behind a bush like you did, Sal, when we're working in the fields. The two of them dashed off, leaving her to get her bearings and unpack without her tatty knickers and bra being seen. She didn't have house slippers, and a nighty had seen better days too. The two of them came back smiling. It's just at the end of the passageway, 
I think we must be the closest. There are two bathrooms and three lavatories, Charlie said, as she unpacked her things. Sal watched enviously. Nothing tatty or cheap about anything Charlie had, and even Daphne's knickers and such looked new. Not as expensive as Charlie's, but a lot better than hers. She visited the bog on the way past, and it was spotless, not like the outside privy she and her family had shared with two other families. She went into the bathroom to check her appearance, ran her fingers through her hair, and gave herself a general tidy-up. Daphne put her head around the door. Goodness, we got...